Okay, good morning and welcome. Let's pray and get started. I uh, would like to request anyone in the class to lead us with a word of prayer. Let's do Father, in the name of Father. Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, this morning we come before you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for all your love, Lord. Lord, we surrender this day, all the classes to you, Lord. Lord, you teach. We submit to the word of your grace, Lord, which is able to build us. We thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sita. So I know someone else began praying. Uh, maybe you could uh, lead in prayer the next time. So uh, here we are at Acts chapter 9, and we started last class describing how Apostle Paul, who was a person, we know him as Apostle Paul, but he was uh, a persecutor because of his zeal for Judaism and how he encountered God on the road to Damascus. He encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. So that's wh where we were. Uh, what I would say is we could quickly go over Acts chapter 9. Uh, maybe you know, somebody can quickly read it and then we can get into the chapter. It's somewhat long, but uh, it's helpful to go through it so then we know you know how exactly uh, we are proceeding and what are all the incidents that are covered under this particular chapter so i would like to request uh, someone to please read we can begin once again from uh, verse one uh, and someone can please read till verse nine so one person verses one to nine another person verses 10 to 19 and uh, then maybe another person verse 20 to 20 uh, one second, verse 20 to 30. So you could read till there. So let's uh, read this much. We'll see how it goes. If uh, you know, we still have the capacity, we will read the remaining. Okay, so verses 1 to 30. That's what we're reading now. So, anyone, verses 1 to 9, please. Okay, I'll read. Uh, then, uh, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and ask letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and, and neither ate nor drank. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, we'll go ahead and read the next portion here. So could somebody read from verse 10 till verse 19? Again, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, called him Ananias. He, uh, yes, Lord, he replied. 
um, the Lord said, go over to a straight street to a house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man, ask for a man from uh, Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I've shown him in a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. The Lord uh, exclaimed Ananias, I have heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized, and he is authorized by the uh, leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, "But the Lord said, go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he will he must suffer for my name's sake." Too much. Too much. Okay. Sorry. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hand on, uh, on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. Thank you. Thank you, Kum. So we'll continue to read from verse uh, 20 now, all the way to verse 30. We we'll need one more volunteer. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus, followers in Jerusalem? They asked, and then he come to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests. Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in the Meccas couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews gathered together to kill him. They were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him, but Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket to an opening in the city wall. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostle and told him how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to the house and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He told him, he also told him that Saul had preached the only name of Jesus in the Christ. So she so, so Saul stayed the cross from them all around Jerusalem is um, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. His All right. So uh, we have an account of uh, the, uh, we generally term it as the conversion of Saul. Uh, the reason being he encountered the Lord Jesus and was born again. And his entire life changed from that time of encounter. So we will look at what exactly happened and how, you know, Saul, uh, began to do the ministry from that point onwards. So we said that Saul was uh, continuing persecuting the believers. He was uh, so uh, adamant you know, about so, uh, doing the right thing, because he thought that he was doing the right thing for God, that he even persecuted, we said, women. So that was the kind of zeal uh, which uh, Saul carried. Uh, but as he had taken permission and he was moving to Damascus, uh, he had this experience. So verse 3, it says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. So we also have to uh, understand that this light, okay, uh, I was explaining to us that uh, Middle Eastern sun is anyway hot and very bright, but while he was 
uh, on his journey, he saw a very bright light from heaven, and that's how Luke puts it. So we also see Paul sharing this incident in other places. Okay, so uh, with those those explanations about uh, Paul and what really happened, we are able to build a, a, a picture okay, of how exactly these things happen. So you would find uh, that Paul, in his defense later on, we will see that now Paul will be saved uh, through the encounter. Then he will begin to do the work of the ministry. He will eventually uh, go and join one of the prominent churches of uh, his time. Then from there, the Holy Spirit will commission him to go into more of a missionary kind of a ministry. So then he will go to different places, planting churches, raising up leaders, strengthening the body of Christ. Uh, and, you know, later, we will see that uh, when Paul finally, after his missionary journeys, he moves to Jerusalem. Uh, over there, a plot, you know, against uh, Paul will will arise, and uh, he will be captured. And from Jerusalem, he will move from the hands of one leader to the other, uh, one government official to the other, um, so that you know people will people begin to question him about his faith about his uh, patriotism uh, and uh, you know about his commitment to his uh, earlier faith and, and things like that so he begins to give a defense for himself that's where you, know, you have all these all these uh, chapters acts 22 and you know further from there so there when he is giving a defense for himself that's when paul narrates this incident again so in acts chapter 9 we see a couple of things that are mentioned but we build the full picture with the help of passages from acts chapter 22 then again acts chapter 26 okay so uh, i don't know if we would want to read it quickly uh, it might be useful for us actually so acts 22 verses 3 to 11 i will quickly read it for us uh, if you can turn to it then please do and you, know, you can look at it so acts 22 verses 3 to 11 uh, there paul says i am indeed a jew born in tarsus of cilicia but brought up in this city at the feet of gamaliel taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest bears me witness and all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. So that's what I was telling us. In Acts 9 we don't see any noon or anything. But when Paul narrates it again, he mentions noontime. So there was a light that showed at noontime. So here at verse 6, now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid. But they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So from Acts 22, what is the picture we get of Saul? We already understood he was very zealous. He was persecuting the people of the way. That is repeated. But he also says that he was born in where? Tarsus. Tarsus of Cilicia is where Paul was born. What was his uh, religious identity? He was a Jew. And he says, I'm indeed a Jew, sort of to stress that he was very committed to his faith. So he was a Jew. He was born in Tarsus of Cilicia. 
then what else we read that he was brought up in tarsus so where did paul uh, grow up he was brought up in tarsus and he was brought up under gamaliel so if you all recall we have talked about we have seen you know gamaliel advising isn't it we we saw gamaliel giving this opinion that if uh, these apostles and the work that they are doing if it is from god we will not be put able to put an end to it so gamaliel is the person that the uh, council listened to so again as i pointed out earlier he was a very well respected uh, teacher in the times of paul so somebody who had a stature like gamaliel paul was his student so it gives us a picture and an idea about the kind of brilliance the kind of experience that paul saul he was called saul at, at the time uh, or you know more familiarly called as saul uh, so this is his upbringing this is his background and he himself states he states that uh, uh, he was brought up according to the strictness of our father's law so he was a very devout jew we can come to the conclusion um, and we can also conclude as he states was zealous toward god as you all are today so he is stating that whatever he did for you know um, even persecuting the people of the way the christians were known as people of the way why did he do it he did it as a commitment to god so you know sometimes we find that um, the people who persecute think they are doing god a service they're doing god um, divine service they are very committed so he is coming from that place when he is persecuting so it's amazing to see that god actually encountered a man like saul okay so today if there are people who are so uh, zealous for their faith that they don't understand what um, uh, you know being born again is what is the redemption of the cross who is jesus you know very zealously they could be going against the things of the kingdom of god but we see how beautifully god encountered this learned zealous individual by the name of saul so uh, another account you know we we would see that in acts uh, 26 okay so maybe we won't read it now because you know it'll just uh, take away time from what so this is acts 26 verses 12 to 20 in case you you want to make a note of it let me uh, just share any key highlights from there if required okay uh, nothing that you know we need to know right now all right so let's move on so these are the two places where he repeats the same incident and from there you know we can we can build a picture of what exactly took place so the important thing for us here is to know that nobody is so um, difficult for god to reach even a zealous persecutor god touched him now it's not a common thing that god encounters people in this way okay now we might ask god and say god you know uh, you have to um, shine a bright light on people and encounter them you have to do it like this so you have to do it like that but god does it in his own way we don't see something like this encounter very often uh, but you know god uh, knows what is best how to meet with people but um, the common thing common way in which people are ministered to is when we preach the gospel to them and they come to the knowledge of the lord jesus christ okay so but this one was quite a dramatic uh, incident then what else do we see so when paul has this encounter he hears a voice and that voice with a lot of emotion when you have a repetition you know of a name uh, you know that there is some emotion attached to it so saul saul why are you persecuting me so this is what the voice says to Saul, and 
what is the response which Saul has? So when God speaks to an individual, there are choices that the individual has. One is to um, respond and say, God, what is it that you would like me to do? Or to ignore the call or just to record it as, hey, God spoke to me. But the response which Saul had was a very good response because the moment he heard the voice, the moment he saw the light, he knew that the God of the universe is reaching out to him to, um, you know, to touch his life. So there was nothing more that was said except, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the response that Saul has is he wants to know who this God is and what he can do for this God. So we'll see what he says. He says, who are you, Lord? So he wants to know the identity of this God. And what is the answer that comes to him? I am Jesus. Now we saw in the account of Acts 22, he's, uh, he narrates it as Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? But here Luke says, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. Okay, that's all that uh, he points out. Now, why is it that, uh, you know, uh, there is no more description of the name Jesus. Earlier we said, you know, Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ is a title of Nazareth. That's a very specific way of identifying an individual in those times. But I am Jesus. And Luke left it at that just to tell us the uh, confidence you know that that god was displayed to saul where he didn't have to explain his identity anymore i am jesus okay and jesus goes straight ahead and he says whom you are uh, you know i am jesus whom you are persecuting now here's the other thing i told us in the last class that when People of God are persecuted. God takes it very personal. So when the question came to Saul, the question was, why are you persecuting? For who? Why are you persecuting? What does the voice say? Me. Me, isn't it? Why are you persecuting me? And that is how God sees persecution. Jesus sees persecution. And later on, when Saul asks, who are you, Lord? Okay, Jesus says, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. So when Saul was persecuting God's people, he did not realize he was persecuting Jesus himself. And Here's the next statement that Jesus makes. He says, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. What does that mean? So uh, there is an instrument that farmers use um, when they work with an ox you know, on, on their farmlands. Uh, they use a goat. And what the goat does is it puts pressure on the hind legs of the oxen. Uh, and whenever there is pressure, the oxen know which direction to move in. Okay, so even if let's say the oxen kick the goat, okay, and and they want to move in their own direction, it may not work. It may not work. So when Jesus was saying it's hard for you to kick against the goats, what he was saying is he was saying you can't run away from me. You can't run away from the purpose that I have for your life. Okay, so. Did that mean that Saul did not have a choice? He still had a choice. We know from scripture that salvation is a choice. Okay? It's not uh, thrusted on people that, hey, you have to. There is no other way. God is saying you have to become a believer. You have to uh, accept Christ. So though, you know, God wants everyone. God does not want anyone to perish. No second uh, Peter, we, we read that. But it's a choice that every human being makes. But Jesus is specifying and telling, reminding Saul, you can't run away from my purposes. That's what he was telling him. Um, then let's move on. So when he heard this voice and had this experience, what was his reaction? 
trembling and astonished. Trembling and astonished. A zealous man was trembling and astonished. It's enough to tell us that this was a supernatural experience which he had. And as I told us, he wanted to know the identity of this voice. Secondly, you know, very quickly, Saul asks the best question. He says, Lord, what do you want me to do? So just look at this. He says, Lord. First question, also, who are you, Lord? So he understood God is speaking to me. When he heard Jesus, a second statement, again, he, he affirms that Jesus is Lord. Okay, So he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? So that should be the response of every human being. When God speaks to us, we say, God, what do you want from my life? And this time, the persecutor turned a child of God, asks this question. Then God gives him a clear instruction. Okay, um, what is this? Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Okay, so uh, for whatever reason, he was not given all the details of his life in that one moment. Sometimes people say, when God meets you for the first time, he should reveal to you what the purpose for your life must uh, be about and all that. But not really. In this case, Saul, such a mighty apostle of God, what does God tell him? You know what? You just get up, okay? You go to the city and you will be told other things, what you must do. So he rises up and he goes. And we see other things about, you know, how exactly this encounter was. So verse 7, there were people along with Saul, isn't it? So he was moving with a team. The people also experienced something. You see, at times when God speaks, only the person who God is speaking to hears it. Sometimes that's the case. Okay, For example, Samuel. When God spoke to Samuel, Eli did not hear. But the voice came to Samuel and God communicated to Samuel. But in the case of Saul, it's different. So why is God, um, you know, ministering to people in different ways? Because he's God. We cannot box him up and say, this is the only way you should work, Lord. We can't do that. So in this case, what was the experience of these people with him? Hearing a voice, but seeing no one. So they heard the voice. Saul heard the voice. The men with him also heard the voice. So it was a divine encounter. And their response was, they stood speechless. Or they were, they were astonished at what had actually taken place. Then Saul got up. Uh, and uh, one particular thing that happened to Saul is when he tried to see, he could no longer see with his natural eyes. Okay? He had to be led by hand and then brought into the city of Damascus. Okay, So Saul went blind. Why did Saul go blind? The exact answer for that, you know, I'm not sure I have it, uh, but you know, it, it was an encounter, okay, which he had maybe. Some people say, oh, the bright light from heaven. Uh, it was something that the natural eye could not capture, and so he went blind. So we don't know. We don't know the exact reason why he ended up becoming blind after that incident, but he did go blind, and he needed the support of the people around him to go to Jerusalem. And in, uh, sorry, Damascus. So when he went to Damascus, Three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So, this is explained by by some people as you know, when he had an encounter with God, it was so real to him that being a devout Jew, he had uh, the the traditions of prayer and fasting as a part of his life. So, it's likely that he just wanted to consecrate himself or dedicate himself further. 
to this God who called him. And so he goes into a mode of fasting. So three days without, uh, you know, three days, neither ate nor drank. So he was fasting. He was blind and he was fasting. And obviously, uh, you know, we know he had the desire to find out what God wanted to tell him in the city of Damascus, because that was the last thing he heard from the voice. Go and you know, I will tell you. More will be told to you about what you must do. So uh, and that's how this whole incident took place. And we also understood the background of uh, uh, Saul. Now, coming to verse 10, we have, okay, so it says there was a certain disciple at Damascus named um, Ananias. And to him the Lord said in the vision, Ananias. So don't confuse this Ananias with the earlier Ananias you know, that we talked about in where? Acts chapter 5. The person who um, was uh, rebuked and uh, he also died, right? So there was judgment. Um, so that is a different Ananias. This Ananias is a disciple in the city of Damascus. So you see, God has his people in various places. When he wants the work of the ministry to be done, what does God do? He just picks, you know, one of his people, he speaks to them. So in this situation, Ananias was the man who was chosen. And what does the Bible describe him as? A certain disciple. So we can come to the conclusion, um, he was probably not a leader of you know the church of Damascus or anything like that. He was an ordinary believer. So God picked a believer. What did God tell Ananias? Again, you see the response of Ananias in verse 10, the latter part, that God in a vision comes to him and says, Ananias, Ananias says, here I am, Lord. So we understood about Ananias. He's a believer, ordinary believer. Second thing you understand about Ananias is very committed, very obedient, isn't it? So the moment God calls our name, the response is, Lord, here I am. It's like saying, I am available. The moment we hear you know, our name uh, in in from the lips of Jesus, when we say, here I am, Lord, it's like saying, whatever you want me to do, I will do. So that is the description of Ananias, an ordinary believer with a very coveted heart. Okay, so how can God work through a person like this? So here is uh, God telling him in a vision. Okay, so now you would see in the book of Acts, you know, there are dreams, there are visions, there is God speaking to Philip. So the prophetic and what exactly is going on? Everyone is picking up the instructions of God through the direction of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is giving instructions to the believers. You know, um, as far as the building up of the church is concerned, as far as the, the edifying of the body of believers is concerned. So uh, it's not like the book of Acts is filled with people, mighty men and women of God who are so committed and they are doing the, the uh, works of the kingdom. Not necessarily. You find obedient men and women who listen to the voice of God. So. Here, we have an Ananias who had a vision from God. God speaks in different ways. Philip picked it up in his spirit, overtake the chariot. But here, Ananias, he has a vision from God. And what does uh, God tell him in the vision? Very, very specific, very, very specific instructions. Arise and go to the street called straight. Okay, it's very interesting. It's like saying, um, the vision is giving you clarity to the, you know, to uh, the last letter. How would you like it if, if God said, I want you to, you know, get up and go to Devnahalli. There is a street over there to go straight, take the first cross or the second cross. Okay, these are the ways in which we describe addresses here in India. I don't know how it works for others elsewhere, but, you know, very specific. So God is telling him in Damascus, Go to the street called Straight, 
and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. Okay, so God tells Ananias, this is where you have to go. Go to Judas's house. And there is a man, Saul of Tarsus. What is he doing? He's praying. So obviously, he did not eat or drink. Means he was fasting. He was seeking the Lord. And verse 12, in the vision, uh, uh, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So here is God speaking to Ananias about Saul, but also he has spoken to Saul about Ananias. Okay, so it's very clear communication what needs to take place next. Okay, in this uh, section, there is the name of another person, Judas of Damascus, house of Judas. We don't know much about who this Judas was. Okay, but what is the conclusion that we can come to? I feel like you know he was again a very committed believer these are all just ordinary believers and god was working in the life of the you know to be apostle the mighty apostle of god who's going to write all these epistles he was working through ordinary believers so for god it's not not even you know, our stature or our position. He just wants a person who is available. Ananias was available. Judas was available. We don't know much about Judas, but he was so integral in the, in the unfolding of the purposes of God, right? In the kingdom of God. That's the beauty of a committed and an obedient life. So here is... Ananias, who got a specific instruction, and he was also told that Paul also is waiting for you, so you better go. So, verse 13, this committed believer, you know, does he just go and, uh, you know, meet with uh, Saul? No, he had his own apprehensions. So, when God gives us an instruction, is it okay for us to, uh, you know, let's say, speak to God and say, God, you know, I'm not sure if I can do it or uh, I need this help or, you know, something like that where, where we uh, are just sharing our concern with God. You would notice that Ananias actually does that. Verse 13, he tells God, Lord, I've heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here... He has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So what is he saying? He's saying, Lord, I'm scared. I can't go. I know who's, who Saul of Tarsus is. Like, are you serious? You're sending me to Saul of Tarsus. Verse 15, God encourages him. And he says, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So even before the Bible tells us about what Saul knew about his purpose, Ananias is told about Saul's purpose, that he is to um, bear the name of Jesus before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. So that is the purpose which God had for who? A persecutor. Is it possible that God calls a persecutor? And you know, Saul was a persecutor. My chosen vessel. God can choose anyone. God can work in anybody's life. Okay, so Saul, to later on, once he became a believer, he uh, ended up doing all of what God had spoken to Ananias about. So verse 16, again, God shares a little bit more about the destiny of Saul. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So uh, the life of Saul was going to be a very tough life uh, with a lot of challenges 
uh, but he was going to bear the name of Jesus to uh, different categories of people, the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. So God was comforting Ananias and saying that, don't worry, like I am with you. This is my purpose. I want you to just get up and go. So obedient Ananias, he went, he entered the house, it says. And laying his hands on him, he said, okay, so some commentators say that, you know, laying his hands, Ananias could have just prayed without laying hands. Why did he uh, lay hands? So maybe, you know, uh, when the vision of God came to Ananias, his heart was changed about Saul. He was scared of Saul, but now he's filled with love for Saul. And Saul is blind. So maybe he just wanted to express love through that touch. So he touched Saul with his hands. And what does he address him as? Brother Saul. Brother Saul. So in the New Testament, in many places, wherever we read brother, brethren, it's a way of uh, uh, indicating that those people are born again that they are part of the kingdom of God. So obviously, obviously, Saul is born again. And Ananias knows that uh, uh, Saul is born again. So he says, brother Saul. So with love and compassion, he reaches out to the persecutor, you know, the, uh, the persecutor that Saul was. And he says, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how did uh, Ananias know that the Lord Jesus appeared? Because we don't see that, right? We don't see all those details in the vision. Uh, we never know. You know. We never know whether the word went around or there were additional things that were told to Ananias in the vision. But he states and he says uh, that this Jesus who appeared, he is the one. He sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Ananias was just fulfilling the instruction that Jesus gave him. And immediately, so when he ministered to Saul, immediately something like scales uh, fell off his eyes and uh, he received his sight at once. He arose and was baptized. So was apostle uh, you know, Saul, the persecutor, born again now, very clear. He's, it's very clear. He was praying and then now, you know, he is uh, being baptized once he receives his sight. So he's on his journey, you know, of becoming a disciple of Jesus and a minister of Jesus. So that's how this entire story goes. So now that he is born again, we would expect that, uh, uh, you know, people will accept him, but that is not the case. So we'll quickly look at, you know, how life went for him from this point on. So we see that Saul was zealous, okay? So something about the personality of Saul is he's always zealous. So earlier he was zealous for Judaism. And look at verse 20. It says, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. So he's zealous for Jesus now. Okay? And God is working through his personality to minister to people. So here is Saul, born again. He's going and he's preaching. He's preaching in the synagogues. He's preaching the same Jesus as Christ or the Messiah and that he is the Son of God. Uh, so people who are listening to him, the scriptures tell us from then on, they were amazed because they knew his background. Isn't this he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? And he has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them back to the chief priest. So they're asking all these questions. What happened? Is this for real? But scriptures say, even though people were not very clear about Saul's intentions, something that happened to Saul was, he increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So you find that he's growing stronger and stronger in the ministry. So here is another lesson for us to learn. Saul did not wait when he was born again. Whatever he knew to do to serve God, he started doing it. The acceptance of people was not a criteria 
for him, right? He wanted to serve this God who saved him. So he did his best. And what does the Bible say? He increased all the more in strength. So God strengthened him in the work of the ministry. And God began to um, do his work through Saul's life. Obviously, you know, the people are still wondering. So what happens? Verse 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. So obviously, the Jews became fed up with Saul preaching about Jesus. They didn't like it. They started plotting against Saul. So what did the believers do? The disciples of the city of Damascus in the night, they made Saul escape. So in a big basket, we are told that he was placed there and you know he was uh, uh, let down, uh, I mean, whatever way, you know, from the wall and uh, he could actually escape because there was threat to his life. Okay, so now he moves out of there and he comes to Jerusalem. And we would think that uh, the, the believers in Jerusalem will accept him. But what exactly happened? When he came to Jerusalem, he tried his best to reach out to the apostles. But they were afraid of him. They did not believe that he was a disciple. And it's understandable because, you know, it could be, uh, uh, you know, it could be a plot, isn't it? that a persecutor is behaving like a disciple and just when you start accepting him, what if you know, he catches all the apostles and puts them in the prison? So they were afraid of Saul. But there was a man called Barnabas. We've seen about Barnabas earlier. He was who? He was a Levite. He was uh, a good man. He was a generous man. Uh, and he's known as the son of encouragement. That same Barnabas, he had the courage to accept a man like Saul. So he took him and brought him to the apostles and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So imagine if there was no Barnabas, okay, somebody who could see the good in Saul, a man who had a, such a great purpose of God for his life, the apostles would have rejected him completely. So there was a Barnabas who saw good when others did not see good. And he was the one who accepted Saul and he brought him into the company of the apostles. So they accepted him. Uh, and you know, he was there with them for, for some time. So he was with them at Jerusalem, we are told. Uh, and again, what did he do there? He continued to speak boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he disputed against the Hellenists or the, 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 the Greek Jews. And uh, uh, they also got upset. So people, the Jews of Damascus were upset. Now the Jews of Jerusalem were upset. The Hellenists were upset. Uh, and when the believers found out that this is what happened, they thought, okay, he needs a place of safety. So come on, you leave, you leave um, Jerusalem and please move on to Tarsus. So they sent him out to Tarsus. Okay, so let's stop at this point. We'll pick up from here. Uh, any questions? There's one minute left. So any questions? There is no question, but to thank God the way he arranges things. Yes. Yes. He arranges things in a way that even where you expected bad things, he can get out good things mm. for sure. I yes. bless the Lord the way he is preparing Paul for a greater ministry. Thank yes. you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. So uh, let's go for a break then, and we will come back and pick up from where we start. Thank you, everyone.